Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to host today's uh, webinar. Um, uh, since the pandemic started, we were doing it um, almost uh, every week for, uh, for four months, um, talking about the issues, most urgent issues of that moment. I'm happy to see returning speakers who we already hosted a couple of times before in our previ previous um, web talks and um, being it on Zoom or using other, other platforms. And uh, I wanna start with the words of thank you to Friedrich Naumann Stiftung who has allowed uh, uh, this webinar to go live uh, starting already from March and also uh, to the GMF Black Sea Trust uh, that allows our uh, work and our activities in the South Caucasus when it comes to Azerbaijanis and Armenians uh, together with, with uh, Georgians on the issues of, uh, of these three nationalities. Um, the um, uh, webinar today will, uh, is scheduled for one hour. Uh, we can go a little bit over, obviously, but um, uh, I would suggest to uh, stick to the time um, because that was the promise to all the audience. Thank you all the participants who have joined us and are interested in the issue. There was really a huge interest generated. We had uh, 300 people registered uh, for this webinar and also we will be posting the video after it will be finished on our uh, Facebook page of the Civic Idea so everybody who is interested and was not able to join at this moment can, can watch the video later. Uh, now I will give uh, the floor to uh, Mr. Peter uh, Andreas Bochmann, uh, who is the head of the Friedrich Naumann Stiftung South Caucasus office uh, for the words of welcome and then uh, I will introduce the speakers. Yeah, thank you, Tina. Tina, I also welcome all of you on behalf of Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom in South Caucasus. Uh, you may know uh, that our foundation is a German political foundation based on liberal ideas. So we try to promote liberal politics and freedom and peace as well. And that's why I thank uh, uh, Civic Idea and especially Tina Tin, who organized uh, this web talk today on the topic of Nagorno Karabakh, which is in all our minds now. So my request is please do this discussion in a very fruitful and also impartial and objective manner. I know there are a lot of emotions in it. Nevertheless, let's try to focus on, on, uh, foc uh, on, on future-oriented or solution-oriented uh, discussion so that we can also do some honey out of these uh, discussion. I wish you a fruitful discussion. And again, thank you to Tina Dean. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, once again, thank you very much. Um, uh, for the logistics, just uh, uh, three quick notes. Please keep your microphones, microphones muted so uh, there will be no um, uh, disturbance, unnecessary disturbance to the interpreter because of the interpretation. We need to keep the line clean, just one person talking. Um, and uh, uh, as, as you already know, we have an interpretation. So for all the participants who've joined us now, uh, you can choose uh, the language you want to listen to this discussion in. There is a Russian English uh, simultaneous interpretation going on. And also, uh, please do send your questions in uh, Q&A. Uh, we will try to address as many of them as, uh, as possible. Uh, now, let me introduce the panel, uh, our distinguished speakers. We have, um, and as we have just one uh, uh, female uh, speaker, I will start with Leila. Uh, Leila Alieva is a very long uh, friend of uh, mine, and uh, uh, it's a pleasure to see you uh, virtually, uh, at least, as we are not able to, to see each other in person. Leila is currently affiliate at the Russian and East European Studies uh, of the Oxford School for Global and Area uh, Studies. Uh, she was previously senior uh, member and academy visitor at the St. Anthony's College of the Oxford University, holds an MA. Uh, she's originally from Azerbaijan um, and uh, was working for think tanks, was the founder and head of the think tanks in Baku over the years. 
Uh, she was a fellow at the Harvard University, UC Berkeley, Kennan Institute in Washington, D.C., and NATO Defense College in Rome. Uh, she is mainly working on the um, regional issues. She has been writing a, a lot, uh, speaking on lots of conferences and uh, uh, arguing for peace over the years, uh, as well as on the issues of democracy and uh, human rights. Another speaker from Azerbaijan we have is Mr. Ahmad Ali. He was our speaker on one of the previous talks and thank you once again for joining us and having time for uh, being part of this uh, activity. Uh, Mr. Ali is the head of the Caucasus Policy Analysis Center uh, in Baku. Uh, researcher, he's a researcher in international public policy and regional security member of the international initiatives on peace, regional security and cooperation, including working groups uh, built by EPNK and the Partnership for Peace. Uh, he is currently lecturer at the Academy of Public Administration in Baku as well. As for the Armenian uh, speakers, uh, we have uh, uh, also a very, very, very long time friend of ours, uh, Mr. Uh, Stepan Grigorian who is currently chairman of the board of the Erevan-based Yerev analytical center on globalization and regional cooperation. Uh, previously, uh, Mr. Grigorian uh, was an advisor to the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Armenia. Um, he was a parliamentary representative uh, of Armenia in the collective security <laughs> agreement of CIS. He was an extraordinary and um, plenipotentiary minister um, of Armenia in the Russian Federation, member of the Armenian Parliament, and I guess the first uh, democratically elected Armenian Parliament after the breakup of the Soviet Union, and he holds the diplomatic uh, rank, rank as well. Um, good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for joining us, um, and that's exactly when I was planning to introduce you. Um, Stjopa uh, Safarian is a founder and expert with the AIISA, uh, an independent think tank um, in Armenia. He um, is the chair at the same time of the Public Council, uh, that is a consultative body to the Prime Minister of Armenia, uh, Mr. Pashinyan. In 2000 to 2004, he was working uh, as an expert on various legal and political issues uh, at the Armenian Center for Strategic and National Studies. Uh, he was the coordinator of academic studies um, and uh, also was the member of parliament uh, uh, from 2007, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and uh, uh, finally, we have also a Georgian speaker, uh, Georgi Kanashvili, who is a senior policy advisor at the Civic Idea. Um, he graduated from the Glasgow University with a master's degree in Russian, Eastern European and Eurasian studies. Uh, Georgi is a fellow of the John Smith program currently. Uh, he is working on his doctorate. Um, he was the, uh, for a long time, he was the director of the Caucasus House here in Georgia uh, and uh, participant, member, organizer, facilitator of the uh, various dialogue, peace building, confidence building uh, uh, programs, um, uh, both of the Georgian Ossetian and Georgian Abkhazian uh, processes um, under the uh, various umbrellas of international uh, organizations, being them NGOs, international NGOs, or international governmental or organizations. Georgi also participated in Georgia-Russian dialogue processes at several occasions. His interests include the Caucasus, the North Caucasus, uh, Russian foreign policy, and Russia soft power, especially in the post-Soviet uh, uh, post uh, space. Uh, and I will try to moderate the, uh, the session uh, in these um, in these difficult and hot times, and hopefully uh, we will manage to to set the example of how this dialogue process should be working um, amongst the uh, people who are uh, nationals of the countries in war at this uh, at this moment. Uh, from the beginning, I want to ask our speakers uh, to. Uh, to have the first introductions, 
five minutes maximum, please keep the time. And also, as I've already said, please don't interrupt each other because it will be a, a serious problem for our interpreter uh, to do her work. Uh, if you can describe a state of affairs in, uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh, but not exclusively, not just in Nagorno-Karabakh, but in, in Armenia and Azerbaijan uh, states, uh, what is the mood, what are the um, attitudes, what are the analysis, what are the opinions? I was, before starting this discussion, I've read lots of articles written by our speakers, your interviews, your interventions, uh, analysis of the situation and the, the, uh, the um, statement that uh, I think all of you, all of us actually, share in these times somehow was nicely framed by Mr. Ahmad Alili, who said in one of his uh, articles that, uh, uh, there is still a hope in the wisdom of the leaders and their ability to lead their nations out of the conflicts to feed peace. I want to start with this optimistic uh, wisdom that we are looking for around uh, for peace and, uh, and give the floor to Ahmed to, to start our, our discussion. Please uh, keep the time. Let's have five minutes for the first round and then we will go uh, with the, uh, the follow-up questions and to the audience. Once again, thank you for being with us and please send your questions so we will have you also involved in this discussion. Ahmed? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, that sentence was written, um, well, uh, let's say, in, in different times. The, the things are changing so fast, like in, in January of 2019, we were talking about preparing population for peace. Now we are actually having the worst escalation since 1994. So it's a big uh, change. And frankly speaking, even I believe that during the um, uh, COVID pandemic, so we were talking how Azerbaijan uh, can help uh, its citizens in Laguna Karabakh also. So that those times when uh, there was a, a high hope for also um, uh, on certain actions, and especially it was um, at times when Pashinyan um, was, and I would say that there was a big uh, positive reputational, um, uh, let's say, uh, the Pashinyan's the, the reputation back then was quite different than uh, he's, uh, he's having now, especially in Azerbaijan. There was a belief that Pashinyan is different than, say, Sarkisian and uh, Robert Kocharyan and all the other guys that uh, led Armenia before them. And there was believed that he is going to, uh, with the being from um, uh, Armenia, not in Nagorno Karabakh, he's going to have a different stand on the issue. But frankly speaking, I would say that it did not help, but in contrary, that uh, probably uh, led us to the situation that we are having now. Uh, when uh, a person from Nagorno Karabakh, I mean, Safe section on uh, or Robert Kocher, and they are um, putting out some statements um, about, um, let's say, certain soft statement uh, that would be normal. Uh, but when uh, Pashinyan tried to be soft and then tried to be more, uh, let's say, easy going with the, uh, the conflict, then you would see in Armenia he was accused of betraying. Armenian uh, national interest between Nagorno Karabakh because he's not from Nagorno Karabakh. And I believe that just because of that, he started making a more published speeches. Um, uh, I, I believe, like the, uh, if Serge Sarkisian or Robert Kocharyan, they uh, from Nagorno Karabakh, uh, they were not that published that as uh, Pashinyan, but also they, it, they did not have that feeling that they have to be. Uh, hard on the issue because their reputation uh, in the 1990s nobody believed that they can betray uh, Nagorno Karabakh. So hence, uh, this uh, Pashinyan being not being from uh, Nagorno Karabakh led to the uh, fact that he became more and more published. Uh, he was a populist politician, but with the speeches that he made, especially his speech on uh, 5th of August in Nagorno Karabakh, when he declared that. Uh, Nagorno Karabakh is Armenia, full stop that, and the, the processes after that, that caused a lot of problems. Um, and then uh, when there was, uh, I would say, uh, the lack of, uh, Azerbaijan was expecting the, the certain reaction from the OEC Minsk group co-chairs, when there was a no reaction from them on the issue, 
which stopped the whole negotiation process. Uh, it was clear that after some time, we are going to have a war. And that is what we are having now. And frankly speaking, I believe that um, uh, Pashinyan, his personality, and um, because he raised expectations, his reputation raised expectations, uh, that after that, when there was no development, uh, that we were warning everybody that if there is a no development by the July uh, 2019 event, there will be some big developments. And for a long time, we were warning that the inside of Azerbaijan, there is a public, uh, growing public satisfaction. And that was something that was ignored also by the, everybody. And the when in, um, uh, the people went to streets and started like, the, I believe you saw those pictures when the people went to streets and started demanding certain actions in Nagorno-Karabakh that limited uh, options in uh, Azerbaijan and the leadership of Azerbaijan. And um, uh, after certain, let's say, um, uh, the pauses and the waiting for some intervention from the OSC uh, mediators. And when there was a none, so uh, we, uh, uh, this, uh, there was a toes escalation and as a continuation of toes escalation, I don't think that uh, what we are having now in September is different than uh, what we are we had in Tobus in uh, July. It's the continuation of the, the same process. And as a continuation of the same process, we are seeing that now uh, the sides are far from apart from, um, uh, from each other. And uh, is what we had in uh, January of 2019 and what we have now, it's completely opposite. So I believe that uh, in this context, uh, the going back to the, uh, the the question that you raised about the wisdom of the leaders, I believe, yes, we need uh, the wisdom in the South Caucasus because the many issues that we can achieve through uh, peaceful means uh, would be different, uh, like the, the same result that we are going to have after the uh, military campaigns, we could achieve it through peaceful means, through negotiations. It's in, in mostly, it's about uh, respecting rights of uh, all. I mean, Nagorno-Karabakh Azerbaijanis and Nagorno-Karabakh Armenians all together. And we need a wisdom to understand that and to start, uh, let's say, a meaningful negotiation as it was pointed out by the um, uh, UN Security Council uh, uh, statement also. Thank you, that's all. Sorry. Thank you, Ahmed. Thank you very much for keeping um, uh, it in time. Um, Leila, if you, if you want to jump in, uh, and then we will go with the Armenian round. Uh, unmute, please. Uh, okay, I will. Um... Thank you very much. Um, it's of course very unfortunate that the, we have now, we leave now the military phase of the conflict. Young people are dying and definitely this is not the right time in general and not the right century for young people dying in the front line instead of promotion of their uh, best creative potential and living happy lives. Um, unfortunately, I think in this resumption of hostilities and uh, uh, there are many interests, uh, too many actors are involved basically in this conflict. And that's why I think, um, you know, it's quite difficult to control what's going on there. Uh, first of all, the, it showed how uh, dangerous is the um, uncertain uh, continuation of the frozenness of the conflict, um, particularly when you don't have peacekeeping forces, international peacekeeping forces or something. When there is no long-term solution, um, at, at the moment it's just a ceasefire, we can see it's so easy for the sake of some goals to violate the ceasefire. We have both uh, countries um, who might have domestic reasons for who are interested in that. Particularly, we live in the era of COVID, when many actors might be interested in the 
uh, uh, destruction of their populations from the, um, you know, the dire consequences of COVID. Uh, but also we have the external powers. Uh, we have Russia, now we have Turkey involved. So each of these actors have their own interests. And the small countries are trying also to use them in their interests, but whether they can, um, uh, whether they succeed in that, that's a big question because as we see, we end up in war. I think the problem is also that for 27 years, um, no justice was um, uh, pro provided for, uh, for the victims in the conflict. Uh, no uh, uh, documents were implemented of international organizations. There is what I call normative uncertainty. In general, of uh, particularly going a bit uh, away from the West, still you have normative uncertainty in Ukraine uh, area, but you also have wherever Russia is involved, there is a normative uncertainty because there is not an equal counterbalance from the West from NATO, from any other countries. Um, so uh, I think this normative un uncertainty and the stuffing of the region by weapons for all these years should have probably ended this way. And we should have expected that. Besides the fact that for 27 years, um, uh, 600,000 or more people were displaced from the occupied territories and they're still awaiting the resolution uh, or restoration of their basic rights. So I would like to stop here. Thank you, Leila. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Stefan. Um, unmute, please. Я, спасибо. Я, я буду говорить на русском. Мне удобнее выступать на русском. Я Значит, уважаемая Тина Тина, Uh, уважаемый Питер Бохман, спасибо большое за эту инициативу. Uh, я думаю, что очень положительно, что известные армянские и азербайджанские эксперты, мы обменяемся мнениями. Uh, понятно, очень трудно без эмоций говорить. Ситуация действительно очень тяжелая, широкомасштабные военные действия, но мы должны постараться понять ситуацию. Я не буду говорить о том, что Армения готова к переговорам, все это знают. Не буду говорить о том, что мы готовы и к переговорам, и к прекращению военных действий, потому что это известно. Но я специально несколько новых элементов дам, которые сегодня есть в, вокруг конфликта Нагорного Карабахского, чтобы мы потом во втором-третьем вопросе, что же нам делать, немножко предметно поняли, да, что же нам делать. От этого очень много зависит. Почему я это начинаю? Вот я слушаю реакцию международного сообщества. Международное сообщество призывает всех нас э, к миру. Они говорят, прекратите воевать и так далее. Но для того, чтобы призывать к миру, надо иногда и адресно говорить, потому что очень часто появление новых игроков приводит к тому, что даже если сегодня мы с Азербайджаном остановимся, я не знаю, война остановится или нет. И вот я приведу два-три новых фактора, которые начали играть. Ну, всем известно, в 90-х годах была большая война, в апреле 2016 года была серьезная война, не буду говорить, кто первый начинал, это бессмысленная тема для разговора. Но мы знаем, что Ильхам Алиев, в общем, не хотел, чтобы статус КВО сохранялся. Поэтому вероятность того, что именно Азербайджан, это логика в этом очень понятная. Статус КВО не выгоден Азербайджану, Азербайджан долго говорил об этих проблемах, и началось то, что началось. Но что же нового вот сегодня, по сравнению с тем, что раньше было? Потому что мы всегда помним, была война, Азербайджан, Нагорный Карабах, Армения защищает Нагорный Карабах и так далее. А что нового? Вот появились два-три новых элемента, которые серьезно делают ситуацию намного серьезнее, чем она была раньше. Первый элемент — это вовлеченность Турции. 
Ни для кого не секрет, что Турция стоит на стороне Азербайджана, несмотря на то, что он является членом Минской группы ОБСЕ. Они не нейтральны. Но раньше Турция ограничивалась дипломатической поддержкой, политической поддержкой, жесткими заявлениями, угрозами в адрес Армении. И все. Вот максимум, что они делали. Сегодня ситуация другая. Турки помогают военными специалистами открыто, нескрываемо, что уже зафиксировано. Зафиксированы переговоры турецких военных, которые наводят авиацию на нас, на турецком языке. К сожалению, есть факты уже наемников радикалов. Некоторые попали в руки наших вооруженных сил. Это подтверждает также Франция. Вы знаете, Франция официально сделала заявление об этом на уровне президента. И это сейчас даже бессмысленно критиковать друг друга. Это уже новые реалии. Турция во время последних учений, которые проводила с Азербайджаном, оставила громадное число оружия. Вы не представляете, какое число беспилотников турецких наши подбили. Причем это легко видно, кадры видны и так далее. То есть качественно ситуация изменилась. Появился новый игрок. Появился совершенно новый игрок. Считает, что он должен помогать родным людям в Азербайджане, но это игрок крупный. И я хочу, чтобы мои друзья, эксперты из Азербайджана поняли нашу реакцию. Знаете, с Азербайджаном мы друг друга знаем, мы жили в Советском Союзе, мы друг друга понимаем, мы друг друга ругаем, хвалим, но мы друг друга знаем. Теперь пришел какой-то враг, который исторически серьезные проблемы с нами имел. 1915 год геноцид, все помнят. И для армянского народа это как бы стало проблемой сегодня выживания. Поэтому у нас правительство не успело объявить мобилизацию. Успело объявить военное положение, не успело объявить мобилизацию. Все мужское население записалось на фронт. То есть качественно другая ситуация. И мы должны это понимать. Второй фактор – это фактор демократии. Вы знаете, в Армении действительно серьезные преобразования. И так у нас степень свободы была высокой, у нас эксперты, журналисты не убегают из страны, не прячутся в других странах, и так было нормально. Но сейчас действительно демократические преобразования. И мне кажется, Алиеву это также нервирует. Будем открыто говорить, мы, мы здесь не чужие люди. Потому что тот режим, который в Азербайджане, он другого типа. Это называется жестко авторитарный режим. И, конечно, пример Армении – это не самое удобное для авторитарий. То же самое мы увидели, как армянская революция или ее влияние в Беларуси проявляется. И, конечно, авторитарные режимы испугались, турецкие, азербайджанские. Поэтому это компонента давления на Армению из-за демократических преобразований также есть. И третье, последнее, я завершаю эту часть моего выступления, российская политика. Ну, российскую политику все знают, когда надо играют, используют конфликт, чтобы Армению и Азербайджан держать на привязи. Это вы все знаете. Но меня очень удивило другое, что даже вмешательство Турции в этот процесс такое открытое, пока Россия по-настоящему реакции не дает, хотя вы знаете, нет, Россия с нами вместе в доброй коллективной безопасности и, в общем, имеет перед нами обязательства. Я не говорю, чтобы они пришли и воевали бы вместо нас. Мы себя защитим. Но они вообще никакого реакции, ничего. Это интересные вещи. Это меняет весь, всю атмосферу и вокруг конфликта, и вот эти новые компоненты, вообще отношение к конфликту меняют, понимаете? Он перестал быть конфликт из-за Нагорного Карабаха. Это конфликт, связанный с самоопределением, территориальной целостности. Вот на это я хочу обратить внимание. Спасибо, Стефан. И, пожалуйста, Степа, если вы можете включить микрофон. Спасибо Uh, Mrs. Uh, Tinatin and uh, our uh, German friends for organizing this uh, important um, online conference. Uh, I will start saying that uh, President of Azerbaijan has never been interested in a uh, peaceful and compromised solution of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. Uh, and uh, although President Aliyev just recently, before this wide, uh, wild-scale uh, uh, war, announced that uh, 
uh, he he's not gonna uh, participate is in 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 uh, imitative in imitation of negotiations. Uh, I think uh, he was imitating uh, all the time that he's interested in compromise sol solution. Uh, my uh, Azerbaijani colleague Ahmad Ali uh, mentioned that uh, they were thinking that Pashinyan is different than Kocharyan and uh, Sarkisian. Well, they are different indeed, but in, in, in not in a sense uh, that you are expecting. And it doesn't mean that if uh, Pashinyan has not a Karabakhi origin, um, he would be interested or willing to compromise or, or, or uh, to give uh, Nagorno-Karabakh back uh, to, to Azerbaijan. But uh, Pashinyan was absolutely different, bringing a new fresh air, a new fresh, uh, approach uh, to the settlement. And that was very, very uh, illustrative. I can bring a lot of uh, statements even made by Ser Sarkisian and Robert Kocharyan speaking about compromises on Armenian side. Uh, on, on some territories uh, instead for, for, for the status of Nagorno-Karabakh. But you can't bring any statement made by Azerbaijani leader, uh, President Aliyev, speaking that except territorial integrity, he is envisaging another status of uh, for, for Nagorno-Karabakh. There is no such a statement. So, uh, I mean, uh, if, if, we, uh, if we dig further, we can find other statements speaking that Aliyev promised uh, to, 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 to his society to return uh, not only Nagorno-Karabakh and all territories back, but also Yerevan, Zangezur, et etc. Et Tell me, please, can Azerbaijani leader uh, buy or, or, or sell uh, this kind of uh, negotiated solutions if he promised uh, to, to return all territories back and uh, at the same time? Uh, I mean, uh, military adventures, uh, adventure, adventures that uh, President Aliyev launched in in last uh, four years since April war, and uh, then uh, this July fightings in in uh, Tawash region uh, shows that Aliyev has never been interested in uh, in compromised uh, settlement. Uh, over Nagorno-Karabakh conflict and uh, respecting what uh, Leila Aliyev said uh, regarding to the uh, human and tragic losses uh, right now we have uh, on both sides. Uh, and But I wouldn't agree that there was no uh, normative uh, certainty regarding to Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, there was, uh, in fact, there were there were Madrid principles, and both sides negotiated uh, for long years. Both sides declared that they they would uh, take it for the basis uh, for uh, negotiations, but never agreed because uh, it it was not important for them because neither uh, Ser Sarkisian nor uh, President Aliyev uh, would be able to sell those kind of solutions uh, to their society, taking into account the campaign, they, they especially uh, Aliyev uh, launched against Armenians uh, in, in Azerbaijan uh, and, and uh, other forms of Armenophobia in, in the country. And I'm not speaking about democ democracy, which uh, is really needed to use as an instrument uh, to, to reach uh, this uh, sustainable solution and uh, to have public support. And uh, coming to the uh, Tavush fightings that uh, took place in, in, in this summer, all my friends, experts, different experts, international community were interested why Aliyev launched it. In fact, uh, I would tell you that it was a checking reactions regionally. Uh, and if uh, we follow the statements made by uh, Mr. Aliyev after this fighting, uh, we can find uh, the answer uh, in, in his addresses. He was checking the reaction of CSTO. He was checking the reaction of Russia. He would like to know whether 
uh, Russia or CSTO we will uh, intervene if Azerbaijan launches uh, a war against Nagorno-Karabakh and if Armenia is engaged in, in, in that war. And Stepan is right. Right now we have very, very dangerous trend and uh, realities and uh, implications. Right now we have three, three different uh, but together acting uh, actors. Uh, Azerbaijani army, uh, Turkish army, and uh, terrorist groups backed by Turkey and transferred from Syria. And there is a lot of reportings. Uh, I think you know all of them, BBC, uh, Blumberg, Bloomberg, uh, Reuters, and all authoritative um, outlets. They, they uh, brought a lot of facts, interviews, uh, to, to, to those uh, mercenaries transferred from Syria and from Turkey uh, and fighting against uh, Nagorno-Karabakh and, and uh, people there. Right now, I think uh, Aliyev uh, has, uh, after Taush fighting, after Taush fighting, Aliyev's position, where oh, we can, I'm, I'm ending, I'm ending, summing up. Uh, I think uh, the position of Mr. Aliyev were, became very weak, not only in negotiations, because uh, Taush campaign just uh, turns against him and Armenian uh, militaries, they, they um, just uh, got very, very important strategic heights uh, in, in Taush region, next to the uh, Tovuz region of Azerbaijan. But the uh, position of Aliyev uh, weakened uh, internally as well. And, and the demonstration that took place in Baku uh, in those days shows that uh, this military uh, adventure is a chance for Aliyev to strengthen uh, it's his position, not only around the negotiation table, but also um, uh, domestically. Of course, uh, I think uh, the outcomes are uh, again against uh, Mr. Aliyev's strategy. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you uh, very much for this, uh, this intervention. Uh, Georgi, um, judging from what we've heard, judging from what we read, what we uh, watch, um, being it uh, coming from Armenian or other resources or coming from Russian or international media, what will be your uh, insight as to how did we get there uh, from hundreds of various formats of peace talks, confidence building measures, lots of money spent by international community on bringing peace closer to the region and actually defrosting, uh, not in a war way, but in a peace way of those conflicts. Um, we are we've still ended up, uh, as always, uh, in, a, in a military, actual military uh, fighting. Um, what do you think, what went wrong? At what moment uh, was there a mistake made by, by the um, uh, various players in this process? And uh, Mr. Um, Safarian was just saying, responding to Leila's comment about the normative assertiveness that uh, there was one, although even uh, in, in this intervention, we've heard that uh, there was one in terms of proposals but it never ended in any signed tangible document that would have solved the problem. And I completely agree also coming from the country um, with two conflicts uh, inside of it. I agree with Leila when, uh, when she was saying that uh, there was no alternative vision ever agreed, uh, proposed by international players or proposed by parties themselves. And, uh, uh, and as Mr. Safarian was also saying, uh, yeah, on the level of statements, there might be lots of statements by, made by leaders about their visions. But when it comes to the papers, it's not just Mr. Aliyev, but I would say all our leaders uh, have this problem of seeing plan B, seeing alternative versions, seeing uh, diversity of the issue and offering alternative uh, solutions to it. So, Georgi. Uh, and uh, and I see Ahmed raised hand, and obviously I will give the floor to to our other colleagues to respond. Uh, but uh, let's listen to Georgi first. Thank you, Bilal. Thank you for like organizing this. Of course, I want to thank extremely your uh, colleagues because the war is unfolding in the countries, and they they found the time to 
participate. In. Uh, first of all, I think the bigger picture, and I guess Stefan was uh, speaking about that information, is obvious because uh, after the war in the 90s, there is the uh, leader and winner of, winner of the situation. And of course, the side which is considered as the loser and that's Azerbaijan uh, is crying, and that where we are the home try to challenge the status quo. Uh, especially, uh, the, uh, I guess, the, there is like growing frustration in Azerbaijan because there are 30 years of uh, passions and trying to find some model for uh, I mean, peaceful means, but that's so far was not able. I think uh, the current clashes also proved and showed very well that uh, the fast breakthrough by force is actually impossible. Although uh, the sides are speaking about by like, participation in the third party century, uh, and Azerbaijan is buying the weaponry extensively as it has financial resources. Uh, we know that Armenia is also like getting up uh, uh, weaponry from Russia uh, uh, prices, like the sum prices. So more or less, I guess, in a, uh, I, I obviously not uh, just because of humanitarian feelings, but like rationally, if we are looking on this process, I, I guess there is no, uh, there is no possibility of a military, let's say, uh, winning in this war. Because always Armenia will have more or less the same uh, like amount of weaponry to somehow rebalance uh, Azerbaijan. And there was one like interesting point made by, uh, I think again by Stefan, uh, about the democracy and correlation between democracy and war and Aliyev and of, uh, something. I, I, unfortunately, I'm quite skeptical because, uh, because the data provides that uh, especially the country, first, like, uh, there is no uh, like direct correlation between democracy and the international worlds. Uh, plus, uh, data also provides the like empirical evidence that especially the wars are starting when the countries are starting democratization. Uh, in the first, like, first several years is very uh, uh, difficult um, in that sense and often like wars are erupting in very bad process. And uh, to speak like frankly, and I'm speaking now about my country, also about Armenia and Azerbaijan, of course there are different like types of political infrastructure in our countries, but still we are quite far from, from the consolidated democracy. And that's why I like to speak that that's like somehow to explain this war through the glances of democracy or uh, have the hope that if Azerbaijan will be a uh, democratic uh, government, something will change. I think I'm not totally sharing this uh, approach. Uh, I think that this uh, kind of illusion as our Azerbaijanian colleagues had regarding the uh, that uh, Pashinyan, he called that if uh, like will be the new democratic elected uh, um, uh, president, the things will change on the Armenian side. No, that's yeah, that's the mega narrative uh, regarding Karabakh, uh, regarding that war, and I guess that any political, uh, let's say, uh, leader coming in uh, government will have very strong and um, unfortunately heavy. Like burden and will have uh, will be will uh, stop for uh, anybody. Um, like two other points, um, uh, of course that process. Um, no, I, I think that like in a close future we will see the end of the conflict. Now sides I think are are, are trying to uh, have at least some kind of victory and like. Uh, safe uh, face, uh, 
I, I think especially from the Azerbaijanian side, it's very important now to have some type of victory militarily to gain some extra uh, territories within this conflict and then stop the process because we see last two days that there is no fast advancement uh, in the uh, territories controlled by Armenia and uh, um, nagorno karabakh from the Azerbaijan side. You see this artillery war. So, I, 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 and the international community is like becoming more and more local. Russians started to talk also. So, I guess the process will go to the de-escalation in a close future. Uh, at least that's the hope. Um, another point uh, uh, our Armenian uh, colleagues said also about Russia. I think in a long sense, uh, uh, there is war now. Uh, and of course, there would be very weird to hear too much complaints from the Armenian side regarding the Russia. But I think on the societal level, this frustration is uh, from 2006 uh, was acute and it's grown. And uh, it, it, let's see how the uh, like things will end up in a close a close future. But this fr frustration towards the Russia and Armenia will grow up. That, that's obvious, uh, especially uh, the uh, behavior of Russia, uh, uh, bringing more questions uh, uh, when we compare with the let's say, quite very proactive uh, um, approach to the Kurds. So it, it's quite a big contrast if we are speaking about the partners from the time. And, uh, Maybe last point from the Georgian side, there is like uh, what I'm observing time to time from Armenian or Azerbaijanian side, there is like uh, discontent uh, about like why Georgia has no more active uh, participation or supporting. And uh, I think that from both sides and from Georgia also, it will be the best case Georgia to uh, pay neutral. Uh, any step towards any direction will be disastrous, first of all, for Georgia, taking into account that we have a bigger portion of Azerbaijanian and Armenian population. And I think that uh, if in a foreign policy we have a uh, kind of success, that is the success uh, towards our Armenian and Azerbaijanian direction, uh, all administrations of uh, Georgian government from Shevardnadze to the current uh, government, uh, realizing that that could be very catastrophic. So if we are speaking about Georgian uh, like, um, direction, I think that Georgia will remain uh, kind of neutral and more or less like distanced as possible from that conflict uh, as much as possible. Thank you, Georgi. I and then We'll go to the audience. Ahmed? Uh, thank you very much. Um, oh, uh, frankly speaking, uh, the, I know Mr. Gagarian personally, Mr. Sakarian personally. We have met on different uh, conferences, on different uh, on various. Oh, but if, you can, if, uh, if you can get a little closer to the microphone. Is this, is this okay? Yes, that's good. Yeah. I uh, I think uh, uh, I know Mr. Gagarian and Mr. Sakarian personally. We have met on various international conferences on different international platforms. And no, can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, I I just and I believe that uh, this pandemic, the pandemics, we there was no flights, no on-site conferences, and hence. Uh, there was no um, lock talkings, there was no uh, contact, so we can clear out a lot of issues for each other. And I believe that we cleared out a lot of issues um, and explained a lot of the different questions to each other. And I believe that we can somehow avoid the current situation. There are like, there is a like, standard question that I, I, um, I have heard, and I believe that there should be some. Uh, clarifications on that. Who started the war right now? 
the role of Turkey and the uh, uh, rebellions, so the Syrian fighters, so-called, in Nagorno-Karabakh. And the problem, I think this is, there are other questions I took, and I believe there is a quite many interesting points to answer, but I'm going to focus uh, on the small sense, and I'm going, probably I'm going to answer the others when I want to talk first. Who started that? Uh, it's undeniable that Azerbaijan has more motivation to change the status quo. Uh, but we wanted to do it through peaceful means. We never wanted to do uh, it through uh, military means. Just based on the one big factor, because Azerbaijan always put it, uh, and always publicly declared, putting our Armenians as its own city. And instead, Azerbaijan started any war, it would be so hard after military action to bring the Karabakh Armenians and Azerbaijan together and organize their uh, living together. So this is this one biggest challenge for Azerbaijan. So Azerbaijan, that's why it was trying to avoid uh, any uh, escalation. So again, it could marginalize Nagorno Karabakh Armenians. You cannot uh, shell, uh, let's say, uh, certain military like countries uh, and then uh, uh, after some short period, you cannot, it's going to be really, really hard to uh, bring in the Grand Crow Armenians and Azerbaijan together and make them live peacefully together. But that's why Azerbaijan was trying to avoid military means at all. Uh, and it's going to be very sensitive toward uh, the Nikol Pashinyan. I believe that when it was clear that uh, he, at the first step, he has to let the territory surrounding the Grand Crow go. And when even Lavrov declared that, even Lavrov declared that the territories around Nagorno Karabakh should be returned back to Azerbaijan and the negotiation should go on, it was clear sign that Pashinyan should start acting. All the negotiations, it was done with Sarxian, and the mediators made it crystal clear that they are not going to have any, um, you know, um, they're not going to change any formats. They're not going to bring in any new player on, uh, around the table, and they are going to, um, let's say, um, um, there, there will be no new element. These are ready document, and when Pashinyan even denied that, they made a statement and publicly put out the main points of the existing virtual peace document. So it was clear that Pashinyan has to start implementation of the document of the existing or agreed, semi agreed, whatever you want to call it. The document that was on the table should have been implemented um, uh, starting from the January 2019. And that's why mediators, OEC Minsk group co-chairs went out and made a call to prepare population for peace in January of 2019. In order to avoid the implementation of the clauses in that document, Pashinyan had a strong incentive to push Azerbaijan to war. And there was a, like the provocation and then another provocation. And I believe that I'm going to come back, like I said that. And there was a, like the, the, the suddenly we see uh, quite, the, um, let's say, elections in uh, Nagorno Karabakh, Armenian's leader, and it was quite, let's say, spectacular. And it was announced that the public administration offices, the some parliamentary institutions, are going to be moved to Sh uh, Shusha. And Shusha is quite exceptionally, uh, uh, there's an exceptional cultural and historical importance of Shusha for Azerbaijan. And then even like the, the last one, when Azerbaijan always complained that uh, Armenians, they are settling, uh, they are bringing Syrian Armenians and there are new settlements in the territories around Nagorno-Karabakh and there are Syrian Armenians. Armenia always would deny that. And for the last two and three like the months, uh, Nagorno Karabakh Armenians would openly say that they are bringing in Libyan Armenians and they are going to settle them in. So, this, is, this was quite a big provocation. So, first, there was uh, Pashinyan did it his best to avoid implementation of the existing peace deal that was proposed by the OSC Minsk Group co chairs. It's a document, it's undeniable. I can read you, but I'm going, I think I believe it's going to take a all the time. So again, Azerbaijan always wanted to change status quo. It has incentive for that, but it never wanted to do this through uh, military means just because it would marginalize Nagorno Karabakh Armenians. Second, Pashinyan did its best to avoid implementation of even, even Lavrov said at the first stage 
the territory surrounding Nagorno Karabakh should be turned back to Azerbaijan and control. He said it in, in, during his call uh, uh, speech at the Gajko Foundation. And then we see a lot of provocations, uh, provocative statements from the Nagorno Karabakh Armenians to Azerbaijan. So we, we should clear on the certain things so in order to move on. Regarding uh, Turkey's role, uh, well, I, I believe uh, I can talk a lot about the, the, the Su-25s um, and et cetera, but I believe I'm going to focus on the certain uh, issues that Turkey has its own interest in the region. So Turkey is not here because of uh, Azerbaijan. It is because of Azerbaijan, but it is uh, when the leadership of Armenia for the last two years, and especially the, the, the last year, they made a the severed deal. They start talking about the severed deal like they never talked about, about before. You know, like I, I believe like the, uh, in 2010 or 11, the, the six sets uh, called to use go and uh, get the Avruda or Iran, and that was a quite big thing for Turkey. And then they said, no, it's not a territorial claim toward uh, Turkey. But now this year. Armenia, with the talking about the severe deal all the time, that made Turkey realize that Armenia is not the one that it wants to like. The, the public image of Armenia, the intention of Armenia, it doesn't. Um, it's not the same thing. And the second reason, second reason why Turkey stepped in, Tovush escalation. It is. It was clear, still clear that when. Azerbaijan always avoided any escalation at the international uh, borders, and the reasons are clear why it wanted to avoid. When Armenia launched a strike, accused Azerbaijan on attacking uh, uh, Armenian positions using uh, was. We all know what was is, and the Azerbaijan army with uh, its all equipment using was to attack it. And, uh, Armenia accused Azerbaijan in there, and then it launched an attack in a place, in a point that was closest to the strategic pipelines and the railroad that connects Azerbaijan to Georgia and to Turkey and to the, all the, the West and the European community. And it was a big call from Armenian side to, to tell Russia that, look, I just started something big for you, you can join in. And when Turkey realized and the European community realized that, the Genja gap that connects them um, uh, to the, the Caspian Basin and the Central Asia, it was clear that Turkey is going to step in. Again, Azerbaijan wanted Turkey to step in for a long time. Turkey never did. Never did. It always was public uh, statements. But when uh, Armenia started acting in a bit different and Armenia started doing all the provocations, Turkey saw that. Ты не следишь за временем. Один час я должен слушать. Sorry, well, I, 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 there is like the this. Okay, I'm going to move on to this next slide. Sorry, I understood that. Um, Syrian rebels, that's that's a very important issue in this uh, context. Uh, there is a no proof. I believe if there was of any proof, um, they would, Armenian side would have put it out. But there is only one thing uh, that all, 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 like I'm seeing it all around the media. It is media reports saying that there are Syrian rebels in Nagorno-Karabakh and all the media reports. It's about some reporters going to um, some villages uh, and asking a person, uh, interviewing two or the one uh, fighters who is telling that, yes, there was a person who approached us and told me that uh, you should go and fight in Karabakh. First, anyone can approach any person in the Middle East and say that, look, I'm going to pay you, but Come and fight in Azerbaijan. Is there any tracking of those fighters in Karabakh? But like, I believe it's the fifth day of the war, and the Armenia several times declared that they have the evidences about the Syrian fighters in Karabakh, and they and they claim that they killed 700 some Azerbaijan soldiers, uh, the soldiers from Azerbaijan. So just I believe that even like the the one of them supposed to be a Syrian guy, and they can capture them and show that there is it. Okay. Uh Lots of questions from the audience, and uh, yes, yeah. and uh, no, but uh, it's sorry, uh, you know, this is uh, it's, yeah. I think it's going to clear it out, and then going to yeah, because you know, this is the older in maybe I understand that. Sorry, I, I understand that I took out the time, but there is a quite important issues, and I want to clear those issues for everyone because this is about the post conflict resettlement process, the misses that we are going to create now, 
it's going to have a long lasting effect. Probably are going to have uh, the peace in a couple of days, but then uh, those narratives that we're going to create right now, they're going to have more long lasting effect. So there is uh, no proof that uh, there are Syrian fighters in the So I can make a lot of statements, but I'm going to react. Yeah. Excuse me, can we react? Can we react to, to this statement? Тинатин, <laughs> Я даю вам время, просто вопрос как раз о том, о чем Ахмед говорил, потому что как раз мы были планировать, я был планировать идти к вопросу, как Ахмед закончил. Потому что война, какие будут последствия, долгосрочные последствия этого очень специальной войны, которую мы наблюдаем сейчас. Мы идем отсюда. Это действительно то, что Ахмед пытался объяснить нам, что все аккуратности, все факты, все доказательства, нет доказательства, говорят точно для этого момента, но также, более важно, для будущего, как мы будем продолжать. Конечно, я буду давать слово всем нашим аналитикам, и тогда then we need to, to have time because there are very interesting questions posed by the audience to address those questions as well. So if, uh, for example, there was a question about the Syrian fighters uh, and, uh, and Ahmed already covered it, obviously our Armenian participants, uh, we, we need to listen to uh, their point of view about this issue as well. So that's why I'm saying, Stefan, the questions that are here are exactly about the issues that Ahmed was talking about. For example, uh, Mr. Margiani, Becca Margiani was asking exactly about, uh, about the, uh, the uh, points that um, Ahmed was raising. Um, so, uh, yeah, Stefan, uh, floor is yours. Please don't go for 15 minutes. Uh, I understand yeah. exactly, but uh, we can uh, obviously shorter. Uh, no, yeah, 15 minutes I will я 15 минут не буду говорить, но моя просьба все-таки следите за временем. Не может один человек 15 минут говорить, а другой 2 минуты говорить. Это первое. Ну, во-первых, я отреагирую на Георгия сказанное. Георгий очень важную мысль сказал, что не так важно, какой режим, очень важно. Дорогой Георгий, из Азербайджана убежали все нормальные эксперты, все нормальные журналисты. Когда мы говорим с журналистами или экспертами, которые из Азербайджана, они боятся говорить правду, они говорят только то, что им говорит власть. А это ограничивает наши возможности для дискуссии, для искренней дискуссии. Это первое. Второе. Значит, официально Министерство обороны Азербайджана, официально, Министерство обороны Азербайджана в июле этого года, вот когда в Тавуше были события, когда были боевые действия в Тавушском районе Армении, да, азар, армяно-азербайджанские, официально они сказали, что нанесут удар по атомной станции. Но вы никогда не найдете официальных заявлений армянских, связанных с нефтепроводами и так далее. Это очень важная деталь. Может, какой-то эксперт армянский что-то сказал. Это меня не интересует. Меня интересует официальный Ереван, как себя ведет. Официальный Баку, это Министерство обороны, угрожали ударить по армянской атомной станции. Я услышал от моих азербайджанских друзей разные аргументы. Уважаю всех людей. И их тоже очень уважаю, лично знаю. Но оправдания войны нет. Даже если что-то не нравится в политике Пашиняна, даже если что-то не нравится, это не означает, что ты должен начать войну и еще и широкомасштабную, чтобы наши дети умирали. И ваши, и наши. Это не оправдание. Теперь про Пашиняна. Я вообще поразился. У нас в Армении в основном обвиняют Пашиняна в мягкости в вопросе Нагорного Карабаха. Его обвиняют в том, что он объявил, что Нагорный Карабахский конфликт не может решиться без учета мнения Азербайджана. Нет, это у нас это восприняли как чуть ли не предательство национальных интересов. Вы здесь мне говорите, что у него жесткая позиция. У него не жесткая позиция. Может быть, нет терпения 
выслушать. Нет терпения иногда. Я по-человечески понимаю. Я понимаю, что у Ильхама Алими нет терпения. Он хочет, он хочет изменить статус-кво. Но оправдывать мы это не можем, понимаете? Оправдывать тем, что какой-то чиновник не так что-то сказал и начинать большую войну, нельзя. Это очень важные детали. Это очень важные детали. Потому что я почувствовал вот это оправдание, что вы говорите, знаете, что вот Алиев вынужден, потому что не решается конфликт. А конфликт не решается, может, по той причине, что у Азербайджана очень жесткие требования. И последнее, я больше не буду говорить, по Шуше скажу. Значит, у нас какая-то путаница, да, наверное. Шуша входит в состав Нагорного Карабаха. Вот того, что было на горно карабахской области. Здесь я, по крайней мере, споров от азербайджанцев не слышал. Это какой-то новый элемент. Азербайджанцы спорят из-за территории вокруг Нагорного Карабаха. Это я знаю нормально. Это зафиксировано в Минской группе, что вокруг этого идут переговоры. Поэтому сказать, что Шуша-Шуша входит на горный Карабах, что вы хотите сказать? Там всегда жили армяне, жили азербайджанцы, очень хорошо. Ну и что? Что вы хотите сказать? То есть я прошу, когда даете информацию, объективно даете, чтобы вы поняли, о чем идет речь. Когда вы говорите вокруг территории, вокруг Нагорного Карабаха, это другой вопрос. И последнее. Значит, Армения привержена Минской группе. Никол Пашинян, у вас, наверное, неправильная информация. Никол Пашинян привержен Минской группе ОБСЕ. Он готов продолжить переговоры. И все, что вы сейчас сказали, все есть в, этой, в, в, в мадридских принципах. Поэтому ничего нового нету. Я не очень хорошо понимаю, откуда эта дезинформация по позиции Никола Пашиняна. Причем я это чувствую, что всюду есть, даже у грузинского экспорта. Никола Пашиняна какая радикальная. Его как раз все обвиняют, все, и правые, и левые, что у него более мягкая позиция. Никола Пашинян первый внес новый элемент, когда он один на один с Алиевым говорил. Это очень ревностно вас. Я закончил. То есть я хочу сказать, что... If, if I may, uh, I'm, I'm thankful to Stepan for, uh, for this uh, clarification. Well, uh, Ahmad, uh, yesterday three civilians... Uh, if, uh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. If during your comment you can also add uh, the comment about the role of international community, there are lots of questions about okay. what, uh, if, if you have any policy recommendations, what the international community can do now, first of all, to stop the conflict, to stop the active phase of the war. Solution of the hostilities, because right now what we are talking about is ongoing hostilities. It's not anymore frozen conflict which we need to, to deal with. Yeah. But, but, Please do and also respond to. Yes, uh, I, I read questions, so uh, I, I will comment not only what ah ah Ahmad said, but also uh, just uh, will respond uh, the questions because there is a question why it started. And obviously it is not clear because we are still accusing each other who started. Let me remind you that um, uh, it was Azerbaijan and Azerbaijani president Ilham Aliyev who refused Vienna agenda and, and the uh, introduction of the investigative mechanism. If you are interested uh, who launched this attack, then please uh, take into consideration that Azerbaijan refused many times introduction uh, of, of or setting up investigation uh, investigative mechanism uh, for for this kind of uh, escalation and also for monitoring by OSC monitors so this is uh, the question to your uh, statement uh, th this is the, the answer to, to your question secondly yesterday three civilians were uh, killed uh, as a result of uh, bombardment by Azerbaijani Turkish air force and Ahmad, they were my relatives, the, 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 the uncle of my wife, his, uh, the, the uncle of my wife, his wife, and uh, the, 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 the sister of, of his wife. So uh, you are speaking about not marginalization of Nagorno-Karabakh people. It's not marginalization, it's killing, it's killing of uh, Nagorno-Karabakh peaceful uh, people. And uh, just coming to the uh, Tawush fighting, I'm, I'm uh, originally from that region and I know the geography. Can you explain what Azerbaijani militaries were doing on the territory of Armenia? Because those fighting were taking place on the internationally recognized territory of Armenia. 
and what the hell Azerbaijani army was doing there. And just uh, let me remind that in those days, there was a high ranking uh, delegation led by Azerbaijani deputy minister of defense in Turkey. And you convinced Turkey that if um, uh, it, it will be late, if not now, and uh, you convinced them that, you know, uh, um, uh, Armenians targeted our regional infrastructure, pipelines, uh, railway, et cetera, et cetera something with what uh, you, you said. And this was your argument, and you engaged Turkey in this uh, adventure of uh, President Aliyev. So uh, there, there was a delegation, there was an agreement, and the military drills followed that fighting, uh, helped Azerbaijan to keep some weaponry uh, airplanes uh, on the territory of Azerbaijan and use it right now. Uh, there is a question regarding to Georgia's role and Georgi also uh, spoke about neutrality of Georgia's territory. Uh, I'm afraid to say that there is a high uh, dissatisfaction with Georgia's behavior, not because of this neutrality, but because uh, many Armenians, they accuse that uh, Georgia's air uh, space is open for transferring uh, Turkish uh, airplanes, air armament. Of course, uh, land uh, transfer is uh, prohibited for all sides. But again, uh, there is uh, this kind of accusation. And uh, if uh, Georgia tries to keep neutrality in this conflict, and which is okay with us, but uh, we, you, you, you haven't allowed uh, Turkish uh, airplanes to transfer military equipment, which is taking place regularly. So uh, coming to the perspectives and international, the role of international uh, community. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, this is, uh, I'm, I'm saying with, uh, with uh, regret, unfortunately, right now, uh, Mr. Aliyev uh, closed all doors for, for, for uh, negotiation, any negotiations for the settlement. And Ali, Mr. Aliyev closed that door even before launching this war of aggression, when he uh, started uh, disseminate different kind of uh, disinformation regarding to the confidential uh, agreements between uh, the Prime Minister uh, Nikol Pashinyan and himself. And I think this, this is something which is against uh, negotiation ethics. The leaders who are negotiating never conduct themselves in this way. And right now, after this high price that we are paying, I'm not speaking only the price uh, that Armenian sites pay, but also Azerbaijani sites as well. After this, uh, this, this blood, this, this uh, crazy, uh, large-scale war that uh, Azerbaijan launched against Armenia and even bombarding uh, some, some civilian uh, uh, villages uh, yesterday in Vardenis uh, region, you know that, and uh, in engaging different kind of uh, mercenaries, you are speaking that there is no evidence. Do you believe Reuters report? Do you believe uh, Bloomberg's report. Do you believe CNN report that there are so many reports uh, from 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 different part of the world speaking about um, the presence of um, Turkish uh, backed uh, mercenaries uh, and transferred from from Syria to Nagorno Karabakh? There are interviews. There are commentaries given by by them. So. Uh, I think we have to understand that we have to stop this crazy transfer. Uh, one of our Turkish MPs just yesterday answering uh, to, to another Armenian Turkish uh, MP, Karo Paylan, uh, just said that Turkey sent to, uh, 400 people to Nagorno-Karabakh. You know that statement. It is made by Turkish member of parliament. And it is not a statement made by Armenians or even foreigners. So we have to expel Turkey from the region. Turkey should leave Minsk group. This is for sure. Turkish conduct doesn't, uh, in, in, it, it is not in line of uh, the conduct of all other countries who are member of that Minsk group. And Turkey has nothing to do in Caucasus and in uh, negotiation process. This is for sure. And uh, first, we have to stop Turkish aggression 
uh, into the Caucasus because uh, I, I, I will uh, be very sincere with, with my Georgian friends. This is uh, leading to, to a, a large scale war in the Caucasus, which is in the interest of many other extra regional actors. And here, uh, not only Armenia, but also Georgia and Azerbaijan will not decide at the outcome of that war. And uh, that is why we have to stop, international community should stop the, 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 uh, this, this uh, large scale war. And then, of course, I, do, I, I see many difficulties to, to, to start negotiations over the solution, but uh, still we have to start from the confidence building measures from, from um, in, in all parts of, of uh, the, the, uh, to the conflicts. And uh, we have to be, to, to understand that uh, uh, there are serious obstacles uh, to, to, to bring uh, Armenia's leaders and uh, Azerbaijani leaders together around the negotiation table after this kind of um, adventure and military adventure. Uh, I think um, I'm afraid yeah. to say that uh, we we can't negotiate uh, with Mr. Aliyev. I'm afraid to say that. Yeah. Well, uh, I think that there is no uh, no alternative to negotiations, and Mr. Aliyev, whether someone likes it or not, is the president of uh, of Azerbaijan. So, uh, but I want to give the floor to one of the participants, uh, whom I believe. You all know very well, Mr. Craig Oliphant uh, is asking the floor, and uh, let me uh, let me bring him uh, to the, with his question to the discussion, and then I'll, I'm going to Georgi. Craig, can you hear us? Um, I believe he muted his microphone, so. Yeah, I've asked to unmute, but okay. He will, uh, he will be back, but before that, Georgi, you, you've raised the hand, yes. Uh, several points. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to first to step up. Uh, you are, yes, absolutely true. Many people have left Azerbaijan, um, and we are, that's different link with the uh, political system there. Uh, correct me if I am wrong, but mainly from those Azeri, Azerbaijanians who left uh, Azerbaijan for, for the political reasons or human rights violation or something like that, I have rarely heard anything different regarding the Karabakh, uh, Karabakh issue. So maybe those people are not in Azerbaijan, doesn't agree, don't agree with uh, Mr. Aliyev in many issues, but mainly there is no uh, radical difference between the, uh, those people living in Baku or in London or in Berlin. Some and are uh, having the expertise on the issue. And to be uh, uh, honest, of course, we are thinking that we are very unique and see, but I will bring extra um, uh, like example. You know that from Chechnya also a lot of people left in Chechnya. Uh, those, also those who are, we are supporting, for example, the Chikari and C. This summer, there were uh, big difficulties between Chechnya and Dagestan. And uh, the previous year, there were big problems between Chechnya and uh, Ingushetia regarding the lands. And surprise, all those people who are in opposition with Tadirov were mainly supporting the Chechen's claim over the uh, lands uh, neighboring with Ingushetia and Dagestan, and they are, we are totally in the same line. So there are some, let's say, mega issues which often unite uh, and, and we often like uh, forgetting other different. Uh, another issue to Nasopa, 
regarding the neutrality. I know uh, uh, and they are aware uh, a lot of like uh, uh, newsies and I, uh, well, of course I'm, I, I'm not the a uh, member of the government of Georgia, and I, I, I don't take the responsibility. But as a whole, for those uh, 30 years like that, Georgia, I think that terms, but mainly uh, is on the right direction and trying to neutralize, uh, be the neutral. And uh, by the way, just uh, a month ago, we heard the same accusations from Azerbaijanian side that uh, we are giving the possibility to Russia and Armenia. And there was a big scandal regarding this Serbian weaponry uh, coming through Georgia to Armenia. So, uh, friends, like uh, I, I, I would say that of course, if there are some miscalculations, that's the problem. But mainly, Georgia somehow is balancing. Uh, between Azerbaijan and Armenia. And of course, there is, we know, and we can speak openly, the pressure from all sides, from Turkey, from Russia. So, like, I, I agree that in some cases, maybe there is some miscalculations, but mainly uh, Georgia is uh, in that direction. I think that all less acting uh, clearly regarding uh, Yerevan and Baku. Thank you, Georgi. And uh, also, I think I, uh, as someone who was signing those, pa those papers for a while, being Minister of Defense of Georgia, I can assure you that uh, there is no way uh, that uh, Georgia will uh, get jump into this uh, plane of uh, creating this balance in the region. It's not just up to Georgia or about Georgia. Uh, we have international commitments uh, that we um, obey and we respect. Uh, and once again, uh, I'm no stranger to that system and I know how it works and I was part of it. Uh, both Armenian and Azeris, Azerbaijani sites were getting uh, papers signed by me about allowing the airplanes uh, um, uh, to fly over Georgia. Uh, and we, uh, we once again stand very committed to our international commitment as to the role of Georgia, keeping balance uh, in this whole um, process and not allowing for uh, um, any, uh, any more complications because of the decisions and of Georgia. And as Georgi mentioned a month ago, there was a huge scandal here uh, picked up by media, very widely discussed for three or four days, I guess, uh, in a top news about uh, exactly the the, uh, the opposite story of Georgia allowing uh, Russian or Serbian, in that case, the military weaponry going to Armenia uh, in violation of our international uh, commitments. We do not have that much time left, and uh, our interpreter uh, will be leaving us also, so I will let Leila to speak. Um, and um, as you all see the questions, maybe you will also pick up uh, some of those questions. Uh, Leila? Thank you so much. I was a bit surprised when I heard um, my Armenian uh, colleagues whom I've known for many, many years, and I really appreciated in the past their very open-minded attitudes to the conflict. And I think that probably some years uh, while we didn't see each other and also the moment, the tension of the moment had made this effect because I felt that the discussion of the Azerbaijani military advance is viewed like a threat to Armenian borders, but it's the war is waged on the Azerbaijani territory. So I, I was very interested in that phenomena that Armenian uh, or Armenian people already see the Azerbaijanis trying to restore the borders as the threat to Armenia. So uh, my uh, co concern is more about that we're speaking on the wrong level. This is a wrong discourse. This is very outdated discourse. This is the wrong issue because it's not the Soviet post-Soviet space anymore. We're 30 years uh, after the uh, dissolution of the Soviet Union. But Russia is still utilizing 
the old Soviet discourse conflict, old pre-modern conflict. We're living in the world where they're discussing 5G economy. We're living in the practically virtual world in the moment. So these territory uh, uh, fighting, fightings over the territory, if this is about territory, this is very outdated and it just shows how uh, little progress have we made be because democratization is not enough. You need also liberalization and modernization of the mind. So that hasn't been done yet. So uh, it's two important steps which should take place after democratization. And that's why we're still fighting, even in spite of the, and in spite of the new uh, leader, uh, which I value very much, also because of my past encounters with him, we should actually discuss not who started the fighting, but our common strategic vision. How do we see our future? You can't really isolate yourself completely from your neighbor. You can't build a wall. And there are much more periods, many more years when we lived in peace, we intermarried, we had wonderful coexistence, and really Azerbaijanis and uh, Armenians, they appreciated that diversity and close, close minds. So we should think how to provide the co peaceful, peaceful coexistence in the region without sort of building the um, walls, finding other creative solutions, because we, sh we can make this, uh, the, the Minsk process, unfortunately, is not um, uh, based on the uh, goodwill, uh, goodwill solutions of both sides, because it basically shows that there is international norms, but if you uh, apply military, you can change this international norm with a military force. So basically, military gains in this uh, process are turned into negotiating tool. In this regards, Minsk process does not deleg delegitimize the military solution. And that's why we always end up with the resumption of hostilities, because if the other side changed the military balance, then it will get more in the solution. So what's needed is probably just let two countries alone come together and think about mutually beneficial solutions, not under the pressure of the military gains. On the, so we, we should first of all delegitimize de the military solution. And this one be done by various offers bringing like, why don't we give uh, more autonomy to Azerbaijanis in Armenia who don't, <laughs> who are not there, but in principle, and you know, then you will give uh, the, uh, this, uh, or let's exchange territories. There are many, many ways to find normal civilized solution, and this will build the long-term solution. This will not, when you get uh, concessions under military pressure, it's very short-term solution because the other side will come back and will try to take revenge. So I'm for the long-term so solution based on the goodwill of the nations who are very close to each other. There are no difference, substantial difference between them. And I really call everyone to think about future and come to some strategic level of discussion issues. Thank you. Thank you, Leila. Thank you very much. I think this is a perfect uh, end of, of this discussion, calling uh, for uh, uh, reminding everybody that we live in a different century and it's, uh, it's a complete, it should be a completely different discussion. But from my side, as, as a moderator of this, of this session and a citizen of Georgia, I uh, should say that uh, um, there is no, uh, no way, well, Somebody, one of you said that uh, there is always a domestic agenda which is kind of dictating its own rules, and it is true, and I completely understand that. And every political leader, especially when elections are coming, is guided by the domestic agenda. But at the same time, there are strategic interests that stand longer and should stand longer than a particular urgency of an electoral period. And uh, for me, as for someone living in Georgia, and living in Caucasus, role of the Turkey in this in this region is extremely important, and uh, 
uh, we cannot expel to Caucasus. For Georgia, Turkey was, uh, and I should, I should say that for Georgia, the most uh, reliable and loyal partner for all these 30 years, um, and probably together with the United States, this is the country we owe our independence a lot. And whatever is left of Georgia probably is exactly due to that strategic partnership. So um, I would stand very much strong against the statements of, uh, of that kind, uh, once again, because, because uh, we all have strategic interests on our mind and those strategic interests obviously uh, sometimes are different from country to another. Thank you all for this uh, wonderful opportunity, particularly for the Georgian audience, to listen to both the experts from both parties. And this discussion, I believe, proved once again how, uh, how difficult uh, and how high are still the feelings um, Ahmed just uh, texted me what about another talk and we are uh, considering to have another talk about the economic costs of the conflict. What will be the, uh, the uh, actual damage that the populations in all three countries actually in conflict affected countries are um, uh, experiencing. So um, we will definitely try to find the experts who will talk about the economy and the cost of the conflict from, from that point of view and host it uh, sometime soon. Thank you once again to all of you. Thank you to Friedrich Naumann Stiftung and the Plexi Trust for uh, uh, allowing us to have this discussion. And uh, let's hope for the uh, peace, first of all, and uh, a long-term solution to our troubles in the region. Thank you and goodbye.